The subcommittee will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on the President's fiscal year 2017 budget request from the leaders of the Coast Guard, Maritime Administration, and the Federal Maritime Commission. For the fifth year in a row, the Coast Guard has seen funding cuts in the President's budget requests sent to Congress. The request would slash the Coast Guard's acquisition budget by 42 percent from fiscal year 2016 enacted level. The proposed fiscal year 2017 request is roughly a billion dollars short of what is required to sustain the acquisition program of record. The underfunding of the Coast Guard programs will continue to severely undermine efforts to recapitalize the service's aging and failing legacy assets, increase acquisition costs for taxpayers, and seriously degrade mission effectiveness. The administration is playing a reckless game. Annual budget requests cut funding for the Coast Guard to pay for increases that other agencies, betting that Congress will not ignore the needs of the Coast Guard and restore the hundreds of millions of dollars needed to sustain its acquisitions and frontline operations. This yearly game of chicken is not conducive to recapitalizing the Coast Guard's fleet or in sustaining its, its missions. What is perceived as the administration's lack of support for Coast Guard programs makes it difficult to continually fight for funding increases during the appropriations process. If the President is going to continue to pr propose these cuts year after year, he needs to tell us how he intends to rescope the missions of the Coast Guard to reflect his reduced budgets. Admiral Zucom to Master Chief Cantrell are here before us today. I want to commend you both for your leadership and tremendous service to our nation. Admiral, I fully understand the situation you've been put in with, with this budget and previous year budget requests, and I appreciate your candor in describing what these cuts will mean for the ability of the service to successfully conduct its missions. The budget request for the Maritime Administration is a slight increase of 1 percent over the current level. Operations and training and the ship disposal program receive increases in fiscal year 2017. The administration is again requesting a one-time payoff to the maritime industry in exchange for a permanent reduction in the number of U.S. mariner jobs carrying cargo under the hugely successful Food for Peace program. Since 1954, the Food for Peace program has provided agricultural commodities grown by U.S. farmers and transported by U.S. mariners on U.S. flag vessels to those threatened by starvation throughout the world. Unfortunately, since fiscal year 2014, the administration has proposed restructuring the Food for Peace program. This misguided proposal will eliminate a vital program for our farmers, put mariners out of work, and undermine our national security by reducing the domestic sea lift capacity on which our na nation's military depends. Members of Congress have repeatedly, in a bipartisan manner, come together to vote down this flawed proposal. I, I hope my colleagues will join me once again in rejecting the President's proposal and work with me on efforts to strengthen our merchant marine. I look forward to hearing from the Administrator on how he intends to move forward with his efforts to revitalize the U.S. flag fleet. Finally, for a second year in a row, the budget request for the Federal Maritime Commission proposes a 7 percent increase in funding over current levels. While this budget increase amounts to less than $2 million, it is hard to reconcile with a 42 percent cut in Coast Guard acquisition. Nonetheless, I look forward to receiving from the Commission the explanation that I have requested from the Chairman of the uncontrollable cost increases imposed on the FMC over the last several years. Our nation is facing a very tough budget climate, and the President's unrealistic request only makes things harder. I look forward to working with my colleagues to enact a responsible budget. With that, I yield to Ranking Member Garamundi. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, Admiral, Chief. Janikin, Mr. Cordero, thank you very much for being here. Um, Mr. Chairman, you pretty much laid it out. We've got a problem here. Our national economic strength and vitality remains closely tethered to the global supply chain, a supply chain that is dependent on safe, efficient, and reliable marine transportation. Consequently, few things could be any more important than to ensure that we invest wisely and sufficient funding in agencies that serve to protect, secure, and facilitate the maritime commerce of the United States. Yet, after viewing the fiscal year 2017 budget request from the United States Coast Guard, the Maritime Administration, and the Federal Maritime Commission, there's only one conclusion that I can make, and that is these are not going to be the best of times. We're headed for a problem here. Certainly, it's the best of times. When you have a Coast Guard and a budget that requests substantial funding to maintain progress on the uh, vital recapitalization of its offshore cutter fleets, especially new funding to procure long lead time materials for the offshore patrol cutter, and to begin the recapitalization of the polar icebreakers. But, but, 
the Coast Guard budget that cuts over $800 million from its acquisitions and construction account, which also neglects the requested adequate funding to address the significant backlogs in both unmet shoreside infrastructure and Coast Guard housing needs is short-sighted and disappointing. Similarly, the great success that we all shared last year when we pushed through the increased authorization funding levels for the Maritime Security Program, it's been dampened by MIRAD's request seeking to fund the MSP at the 2015 funding level while also perpetrating the administration's ill-advised food aid reform policies. I must tell you, it is disappointing to see this come back again and again and again. The chairman spoke very clearly about the uh, lack of wisdom of that program and what it means to our mariners, and more important, what it means to starving people around the world. I note Ethiopia and the crisis that they're having there and the need for food purchased locally? Are you kidding me? So, maybe we can put an end to the ill-advised reform that is inherent in this proposal, Mr. Janikin. On top of all this disappointment, we also find that the administration has not requested funding for Title XI loan guarantees for the small shipyards. Everybody wants to talk about making it in America, about manufacturing, about jobs, and one of the most important programs we have available to us on the cheap, Title XI. Hmm. So we're going to starve it. In closing, if you want to have a reliable marine supply chain and a vibrant maritime and shipbuilding industry and a safe and secure marine environment and to deter drugs and, 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 Better fund the Coast Guard, folks, and the Merchant Marines. This budget doesn't do it. So let's get in a brawl with the administration, and let's make some choices. I just left a meeting this morning with the uh, Air Force that wants to uh, rebuild their entire nuclear arsenal at a cost of several billion a year. So let's make some choices. Coast Guard comes out on top. Merchant Marine comes out on top of that equation. All right, enough said. Let's get on into it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Thank the gentleman. Our panel of witnesses today is Admiral Paul Zukunft, Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Stephen Cantrell, the Honorable Paul Janikin, Administrator of the Maritime Administration, the Honorable Mario Cordero, Chairman of the Federal Maritime Commission. Admiral, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Garamendi, members of this subcommittee, let me first express my profound thanks to this subcommittee for the largest appropriation in Coast Guard history in fiscal year 16. It literally got us out of debt, but we're here to talk about the President's budget in FY17. I first ask that my written statement be accepted as part of the official record. Okay. Uh, the fiscal year 2016 appropriation significantly advances our long-term acquisition strategy, and it provides stable operating funds for new assets. You are helping us build a 21st century Coast Guard postured for mission success around the globe. Notably, our increased efforts and our southern approaches and transit zones netted 700 smugglers, uh, arrests, and seized over 190 metric tons of pure cocaine destined for the United States this past year. You can be assured that we are leveraging the full scope of the intelligence community to drive our operations and disrupt transnational criminal networks attempting to move illegal goods and people by sea. Last year, two of our national security cutters returned to port and offloaded more than a billion dollars worth of pure cocaine. But it's not just about the drugs. These cartels also undermine rule of law, good governance, as we see in Central America, where eight out of the ten most violent countries in the world exist south of the border, which also gives rise to human trafficking and unaccompanied minors arriving on our southwest border. Our interdictions at sea are making a significant difference, um, but we're doing so with very finite resources. The appropriation you provided in 2016 and the President's budget request in 2017 will allow us to move forward 
with the most important acquisition we have undertaken since 1790, and that is the recapitalization of our 50-year-old medium endurance cutters with the offshore patrol cutter. Now, I remain confident we will down-select to a single shipbuilder and award the offshore patrol cutter detailed design by the end of this fiscal year. The budget also provides funding to continue our efforts to complete our program of record for the fast response cutter. We are in negotiations to award phase two of the fast response cutter contract, and I remain committed to attaining a fair and reasonable price for the American public. The recapitalization of our cutter fleet is the Coast Guard's top priority, and I am open to all acquisition strategies, including multi-year and block buy options. These new ships increase our operational capability, best leverage intelligence, and most importantly, they keep our men and women safe on an often unforgiven sea. Moving to the polar regions, the Cutter's Healy, Cutter Healy reached the North Pole this past summer in support of United States Arctic interests and sovereignty. Today, Cutter Polar Star is homeward bound after completing a successful breakout and resupply of McMurdo Sound in Antarctica. She is the only heavy icebreaker in the United States inventory capable of completing that mission, and she has less than seven years of service remaining. I'm grateful for the President's request for $150 million that demonstrates our commitment to building heavy icebreakers and takes this project through the critical design phase and avoids the uncertainty that often plagues shipbuilding process, projects. I look forward to continuing to work with you to accelerate heavy icebreaker acquisition. In closing, investing in a 21st century Coast Guard is as much about people as it is about platforms. Our 2017 budget request allows us to continue to build the workforce of the future. Now, this is not without challenges. Though we have the best workforce in Coast Guard history, I am seeing the impact of decreased retention and slowed accessions. Our increasingly uncertain and complex world requires high-end skill sets from an in-demand talent pool, such as cyber, intelligence, marine inspections, and technically trained professionals have many options today besides serving in the military service. To that end, we are crafting the Coast Guard Manpower Requirements Plan to baseline our 21st century workforce as this committee has mandated. As I said in my State of the Coast Guard address, and I am an optimist, these are the finest hours to serve in the United States Coast Guard. I thank you for your support in making that a reality. I look forward to working with the subcommittee as we make prudent investments in the 21st century Coast Guard. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Commandant. Master Chief, I understand you have comments for the record. Do you want to make a statement? No, sir. I'll just forego some limits of time, and then uh, I'll be ready to answer questions when you guys are. Roger. Okay. The Honorable Chip Janikin is recognized. Good morning, Chairman Hunter, Ranking Member Garamendi, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the President's fiscal year 2017 budget priorities and initiatives for the Maritime Administration. The fiscal year 2017 budget request is $428.1 million, which funds activities supporting national security, strategic mobility, ships and shipping, port operations, ship disposal, environmental sustainability, and mariner training and education. The President's budget request continues to support funding readiness for programs that support the Department of Defense sea lift requirements. For fiscal year 2017, $186 million is requested for the Maritime Security Program, or MSP, to fund $3.1 million for each of the 60 ships enrolled in the program. That funding amount was based on the program of record prior to the increased authorization amount that was included in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2016. The timing of that authorization did not allow sufficient time for us to analyze the new funding levels to support submission with the President's fiscal year 2017 budget request. The MSP provides direct annual stipends for up to 60 active, commercially viable, militarily useful, privately owned U.S. flag vessels and crews operating in international trade. The MSP fleet ensures access to U.S. flagships and ocean-borne commerce with the necessary intermodal logistics capability to move military equipment and supplies during armed conflict or national emergency. Funding provided from the U.S. Navy will allow the Maritime Administration to continue to provide surge sea lift support in 2017 through our Ready Reserve Force program. This is a fleet of 46 vessels whose primary purpose 
is to provide for rapid surge movement of defense equipment and supplies in support of global projection of our armed forces and to respond to national and humanitarian emergencies globally. It takes many years of training to develop the, nat the necessary merchant mariner competencies to operate these ships. The U.S. Merchant Marine Academy and the six state maritime academies graduate the majority of the U.S. Coast Guard credential merchant marine officers needed to crew these vessels. To support the necessary training, the President's fiscal year 2017 budget request includes $99.9 .9 million for the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. This request will enable the Academy to achieve its core responsibility of providing the highest caliber of academic study with state-of-the-art learning facilities for the nation's future merchant marine officers. The budget request also includes $29.6 million for the State Maritime Academy program. This request includes $22 million to fund maintenance and repair costs for the federally owned training ships that are on loan from the Maritime Administration to the six State Maritime Academies. The training ship fleet is aging. With an average age of 37 years and the oldest, the Empire State at the State University of New York Maritime College is 55. Through the fiscal year 2017 budget request, the Maritime Administration is requesting priority maintenance for the six training vessels to ensure they all meet safety and functional requirements to stay in service as long as possible. Additionally, the Maritime Administration will be validating the next appropriate steps to ensure adequate shipboard training capacity remains available in order to produce sufficient quantity and quality of mariners to support our sea lift needs into the future. The fiscal year 2017 budget request also reflects a continuing commitment to reducing and mitigating maritime transportation related impacts on the environment. This includes a request for a ship disposal program of $9 million to support, support uh, disposal of non-retention National Defense Reserve Fleet vessels that are in the worst condition with priority, priority emphasis on the removal of the three remaining obsolete vessels in the Susan Bay F Reserve Fleet that were identified in the April 2010 California Court Distent Decree. The President's fiscal year 2017 budget request also includes $11 million for the inactive former nuclear ship Savannah. This includes $8 million to begin the Nuclear Regulatory Commission required decommissioning process, including the dismantlement and decontamination of the defueled nuclear propulsion plant on board the vessel. In addition, the budget request includes $3 million for energy and environmental technology initiatives designed to enhance maritime sustainability and affordability through our Maritime Environmental Technical Assistance Program. Finally, the fiscal year 17 budget requests $3 million for a pilot program to support port infrastructure improvements through our Strong Ports Program. This funding will provide port planning grants to enable ports to create investment grade infrastructure development plans that comply with federal planning requirements and satisfy private lending institutions and also promote public and private partnerships. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your opportunity to present and discuss the President's fiscal year 2017 budget request for the Maritime Administration. I'll be happy to respond to any questions that you or members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you, Administrator. Uh, Chairman Cordero, you're recognized. Chairman Hunter, Ranking Member Garamandi, members of the subcommittee, good morning and thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify in support of our fiscal year 2017 budget. With your permission, I will summarize my prepared remarks, which I kindly request to be entered into the record. Please allow me to begin by reporting our response to two congressional mandates we were given last year by way of the Harvard Cobalt Coast Guard Act of 2014. The commission issued a rule that became effective on March 1st, 2016, that implements the term limits on our commissioners and changes how attorney fees are awarded in cases brought before the FNC. Mr. Chairman, in 2015, the United States saw a level of international container traffic that has a record-breaking 31.5 million TEUs. The commodities inside these containers carried on ship transiting marine terminals all move on top of a regulatory system that seeks to facilitate trade while protecting an American shipper from unlawful anti-competitive behavior. That regulatory system is the jurisdiction and responsibility of the Federal Maritime Commission. And through our work, we facilitate and safeguard fair, efficient, and reliable transportation for ocean-borne transportation cargo, international cargo. International container trade is growing significantly based on conservative estimates on a 5% annual growth. Box volumes will double by the end of the next decade. That is tens of millions of containers above and beyond the 30 million TEUs that arrived here last year and are already overwhelming our marine terminal infrastructure, leading to port congestion and inefficiencies in the supply chain. If left unaddressed, 
Congestion in our marine terminal gateways and maritime gateways will result in gridlock, and that is an outcome that none of us can afford to see come to pass. We have directly tackled this issue of congestion. The latest development on this issue is the unanimous vote that was taken in February by the Commission to establish the Supply Chain Innovation Team Project. That effort will be led by Commissioner Rebecca Dye and will culminate in a report to be issued to the FMC. At the same time, as container volumes are growing, the container shipping industry is going through a period of major change. As a result of merger and acquisition activity, we anticipate considerable consolidation among container carriers, the net effect of which will likely be game-changing impacts on the marketplace. Additionally, we are noting a marked increase in the number of agreement filings made at the Commission by VOCCs and MTOs. These agreements reflect a trend in which carriers and terminal operators have increased working cooperation with each other sharing resources and assets. In short, we are projecting the future where millions and millions of more containers are going to be entering the United States. The ships calling to the United States are ever going to be larger. The increased influence of foreign controlled vessels via vessel sharing alliances. There is a substantial consolidation in the industry among those overseas boat based entities and those very same companies are increasingly working cooperatively to share resources and assets. Chairman Hunter, the future has arrived. It is happening now, and it is fraught with challenges. Indeed, the Journal of Commerce noted in a recent issue, and I will quote, global changes in container shipping are confronting the U.S. Maritime Commission with some of the most difficult decisions in its 55-year history. As trade grows and the shipping industry consolidates, the Commission will need to increase its monitoring and analysis of the industry in order to ensure that the American shipping public and ultimately the American consumer does not become a victim of decreased ocean transportation options or unlawful anti-competitive behavior. This will be accomplished via through ongoing and thorough careful review of service contracts and the VOCCs and MTO agreements filed with the FMC. Just as containers volumes are hitting record levels, so are the number of filings received by the agency. It is significant, resource intensive, and time consuming work to assess what these documents reflect in terms of business trends. There is a significant strain to our agency's resources as our employees endeavor to stay on top of the amount of this work. Simply put, we need additional specialized personnel in order to help meet the FMC mandate. In previous years, this subcommittee has encouraged us to be efficient and how we spend our appropriated funds. And I assure each and one, each in, uh, of you, even without this directive, the FNC is diligent in maximizing its dollars. Recent steps have been taken to save money. One, looking for opportunities to share services with other agencies. Two, reducing the amount of space we have in our headquarter buildings to save on our lease costs. Three, delaying hiring of new personnel so as to create funds so we can use to address pressing requirements such as conducting our information technology refresh. Four, bringing whatever human resources we can in-house in order to save money and payments uh, that we make to OPM. That said, only 2% of our budget may be characterized as discretionary spending. Furthermore, even though we are a small agency, we must comply with each and every obligation that other federal agencies required to meet. For example, the Commission responded to at least 75 different annually funded reporting requirements. When these are unexpected uh, and we need to act on these requirements, the costs associated with satisfying that directive must come out of a budget that's already spoken for in its entirety. The Federal Maritime Commission budget request will alleviate some of the stressors that are challenging our ability to continue to operate effectively and responsibly. We hope our request will be supported by the subcommittee at the full amount. Thank you for your time and attention and consideration. I am pleased to answer any questions you have regarding our budget request or any issues over which the Federal Maritime Commission has jurisdiction and can share our valuable insight. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, before we get into the question portion of the hearing, I would like to submit for the record the statement of Dr. Kathleen Sullivan, Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and Administrator for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Without objection, so ordered to myself, 
The NOAA Office of Response and Restoration has oil and chemical spills and marine debris programs which fall under this subcommittee. Some of us to also take a parochial interest in other NOAA programs within the Office of Coast Survey since all nautical charts and surveys are critical for safe navigation. So we're not going to move on to questions, but before I do that, Chairman Cordero, you have three Federal Maritime Commissioners here with you today. Rebecca Dye right behind you, Michael Quarry, and Paul and Bill Doyle. just want to say welcome and, uh, and thanks for being here. Um, and with, with that, I'm going to yield to Mr. Garamani to start with the questions so I can call my kids before they go to school really quickly. They must start very late or else they're in San Diego. They're in San Diego. They're in San Diego. Okay. Uh, Admiral Zumkoff, a uh, series of questions uh, about the uh, fast response cutter, the contract. Where are we with it? Uh, phase two, brief us. Uh, Carson, right now we are uh, continuing negotiations for a fair and reasonable price, uh, and we're making great progress. Uh, I know there may be consternation among some of what is in the, the next block by uh, the final 26 of these ships. Um, the one change is we are modernizing the command and control systems because the ones on the first 32 will have reached obsolescence by the time these next 26 are delivered. Um, but basically it is the same whole form. Uh, and so we are in negotiations right now. Uh, we will need to re reach closure on these negotiations by mid-May so we do not have a disruption in the build-out of this very critical asset. So we can look forward to fiscal year 17, moving these contracts underway and expenditures being made? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we, we have got to come with a fair and reasonable agreed-upon price with the and, vendor. And you uh, say the control systems on the previous set are going to be obsolete? Uh, right. These are command and control systems. It's computers. It's surveillance systems. And as we find, these normally have a shelf life of, of 10 years maybe at most. Um, by the time these are built out, those will be obsolete. So that, that's the one modification that will be made. Uh, the offshore patrol cutter, uh, can you assure us that uh, you'll be awarding the contract by the end of this year? Uh, Congressman, we have three very incentivized vendors, and those requirements are coming forward as I speak. And by the fourth quarter of this fiscal year, we absolutely will down-select the one vendor to move this forward. Uh, and again, I am very thankful for the subcommittee for putting in our appropriation, the final design work, which was going to be a huge lift for us and the department, but that was put into our appropriation so we could move this major acquisition forward. So you were able to get one icebreaker to the North Pole. Let's talk about the Polar Sea. Where are you with that? Uh, and then also the uh, $140 million for some sort of new icebreaker. Uh, thank you for that question, Congressman. So uh, we have pulled the Polar Sea out of the water to do a material assessment on the ship. Uh, a third party will, will validate and provide us uh, that assessment uh, by this summer. Uh, and within that should be a threshold of what it would take to reactivate the Polar Sea. Uh, recognizing that would be a, a re reactivation probably measured in less than 10 years. And so it really becomes a business decision. Is it a prudent investment to put that much money in a ship that's been laid up for six years? And some of those parts were cannibalized in order to bring the Polar Star into service as well. What this $147 million set aside does, uh, it has already incentivized industry. It says we can build a polar icebreaker here in the United States. And maybe we look at parent craft designs. It provides a certainty that we'll, we will need to go forward as we have seen through uh, funding lapses and continuing resolutions that have disrupted some of our major acquisitions, but this is not one that time can wait upon. Uh, we need to move this project forward. So we're really looking at two ships here, maybe. The uh, Polar Sea being recommissioned, uh, rebuilt, recommissioned, and then this new heavy polar icebreaker. So we're really looking at a, a variety of options. Uh, one, we have Polar Star, and we project she has roughly seven years of service life remaining. Uh, a catastrophic casualty could, could change that. We have the potential reactivation of the Polar Sea. Uh, we've looked at leasing options, uh, but quite honestly, we've looked across the inventory here in the United States, and there are no ships that meet the requirements of either a medium or a heavy icebreaker 
for leasing. Uh, you may know uh, we've looked, I have a 13-page matrix that we looked side by side with the IVIC. Uh, and, and that vessel will not meet Coast Guard requirements. Uh, we put an operation requirement document together, crosswalk that with the Arctic Research Council, National Science Foundation, Defense, Interior, Commerce, Coast Guard, and all came to agreement that this is what we need an icebreaker to do for the United States of America. So that requirement is out there. And so that leaves us with the final alternative of reacquiring, buying new, uh, a heavy icebreaker. If the Polar Sea is to be rebuilt, repurposed, you will need money in the 17 budget to carry that forward. Uh, we will, and we have this $147 million that's currently in the President's budget. So that is an option. Uh, and fortunately, we will have this summer to make that final decision and fully brief members of this subcommittee of what it would take to reactivate a nearly 40-year-old ship. And be honest, of how many more years do you get out of a 40-year-old ship and how much money do you put into it? Uh, it sounds so, like so those you have made a decision already. Uh, we have not, so we will see what it will cost. Uh, but that will provide us a floor and maybe not a ceiling of what it would take to reactivate a ship of that age. So if the Polar Sea is to be rebuilt, repurposed, there will only be money for the Polar Sea and not for the second or third heavy icebreaker. Uh, either way, uh, Congressman, it would require further top-line relief in, in our budget. So this $147 million is a, is a top-line relief. Uh, there were some back and forth whether it would come at the expense of some of our other more mature acquisition programs, such as the fast response cutter. Well, you are aware of the interest of the chair and the ranking member in icebreakers. So when's the next time you're going to report back to us? about uh, the Polar Sea? Yeah, yeah, the next report will be when we get the material assessment back on the Polar Sea, which will be this summer. summer. is a three-month or four-month period. Could you be more precise? I asked the same question on my staff yesterday because I know you were going to ask me that question. And the answer was? <laughs> I'm going to say July 31st. July 31st? 31st. I think we're leaving before that, so why don't you <laughs> push that up a week while we're still here? Will do. Thank you. Yield back. Thank the gentleman. I, I called my kids. Nobody answered. Now they're all calling me back right now. Right. That's just how it works. Um, <clears throat> this my my uh, first question is is this? Let's talk, let's talk about nukes really quick. Look, we we had a hearing here. We talked about um, if you can get uh, coke on U.S. soil, you can get nuclear weapons on U.S. soil. And with the Iranian deal, let let's just say that 10 or 15 years from now, nuclear weapons are not you you ubiquitous, but they're more prevalent throughout the world. You'll have North Korea, you'll have Iran at that point. They will have maybe sold them off. And what we're looking at for the first time ever is non-state actors with nuclear weapons, where, there's, where, you, where we can't attribute a strike to anybody. There's, there's, no, there's no way to retaliate. There's, there's no deterrent in retaliation because you're not going to, because they're, they're non-state actors, right? So, so my question is, what is the Coast Guard doing 10 years out from now? I mean, that, that would be numero uno priority, right? What are you doing to face the nuclear threat that we could be facing, not, not getting shot at by an ICBM, but simply having something either come across the border, come into a port, come in with the same routes that they use Coke, or they, they bring up Coke? Uh, Chairman, we have um, a number of actions in place as I speak right now. One is being a member of the national intelligence community. Uh, intelligence drive operations, so when I look at counter drug as an example, uh, two years ago, right before I came into this job, uh, we had awareness of about 80 percent of the maritime drug flow destined for Central America, but ultimately destined for the United States. But on any given day, we had enough resources, and back then we had the Navy's Perry-class frigates in our inventory to target maybe 15 percent of that 80 percent. So we knowingly let 65 percent get through. Uh, since then, uh, the Coast Guard has nearly doubled its presence at the expense of other missions. Uh, and so we've closed some of that gap, but now we no longer have the Navy Perry-class frigates in our inventory. So it's pretty much a, a, a white-hull Coast Guard mission. Uh, but 
when you look at the nuclear threat, we use that same maritime domain awareness. Uh, we have a special force team. We have two in the United States Coast Guard, one in San Diego, one in Chesapeake, Virginia. Uh, we have over a dozen bilateral agreements with flags of convenience that authorize the Coast Guard to board those ships anywhere on the high seas if we expect that there is a weapon of mass destruction aboard that ship. We don't ask permission. Um, and we come in covertly, um, but we use it leveraging our Title 14 authorities. And so it, it's a unique set of authorities, bilateral agreements, but it's the platforms that we've invested in as well. The National Security Cutter can operate in a suburban environment. Our people that fast rope, hook and climb operate in suburban environments. And if they have to compel compliance using Title 10 authorities, they squeeze off about 40,000 rounds a year. Uh, these are the Let folks that you want to call. Um, what about nukes coming in just in, in uh, cargo containers? Um, with cargo containers, uh, we work closely with Customs and Border Protection at the Na National Targeting Center <laughs> in Reston, Virginia, uh, where every cargo manifest, every crew member is screened uh, from consignee to the packer uh, to discriminate if there's a new shipper you know, in, you know, that's put something in a container that may profile that particular container as a potential threat. So we've increased our domain awareness uh, just through the National Targeting Center as well. Does it make sense in your point of view to test every cargo box on a ship prior to it being loaded or when it's off offloaded? If we were to do that, we would literally gridlock our, our Well, not, not necessarily. I mean, based on the technology that exists today, you can drive stuff through those those uh, quick scanners at certain ports that they have those now, right? In fact, yeah. didn't, didn't uh, it's not Kuwait. Is it Dubai that, that has that scans every single cargo container that comes into their to their country? And uh, I'm not certain, certain about Dubai. The technology may may get there, um, but if you have to open and inspect, you know, each container um, be, before it is destined for the global market. Uh, the time that it would take would literally disrupt our supply chain. We, we had a hearing here. There's technology right now where you can see through it. You don't have to open and inspect them. Right. Right. At, a, at a much higher level, if I were to try to conceal you know, a weapon of mass destruction with, with the appropriate shielding, that may not be detectable. Uh, so the intel, intelligence... But the shielding is now detectable, too, because you right. can see a shield. Hmm. You can see the lack of the neutrinos moving around if it's, if it's shielded, right? Right. So, uh, but that would cause you to open and inspect a given container. Maybe you don't open each and every one of those. But right now we have that, that technology today to make those informed decisions. And, and we do actually carry out that work, uh, working hand in hand with the Customs and Border Protection. So, so that's more CBP? CBP and Coast Guard. I would say it's probably 70% CBP, 30% Coast Guard. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so, so let's get into really quick to a a acquisitions. You, you talked about block buy options. You talked about multi-year procurement. Um, so, so we we've we've been talking about this. Tell me why it hasn't been done yet. If you're amenable to doing it, yeah. I mean, because um, you're going to be building cutters for the, the next decade. Right. So let me turn the hands of time back to when we first acquired the National Security Cutter. We did it under the uh, through a third party known as Deepwater. Uh, we finally moved that acquisition program in-house under the United States Coast Guard. Um, so we, we were not able to do that with the National Security Cutter. Uh, we've also gone through variations as much as 35, 40 percent in over a three to four year period in our ACNI budget. Uh, when we do a block buy, uh, we almost put that block buy into a non-discretionary element of our budget, and so we have to make difficult trade-off decisions, but if we're making this block buy, we will incur a penalty if we can't deliver on that block buy purchase, and maybe it comes at the expense of other operations. Uh, and that's where having a stable... Wait, explain that. Explain that. Why would you incur a penalty on a, if you do a block buy? So if I'm saying I'm going to do a block buy and say I want to do a block buy of two offshore patrol cutters in 2021, um, but then my, my appropriation for that year is something less than what I needed um, to build out those two OPCs, well, I've got to commit to that block buy or I will pay a penalty to that, to that vendor. So I lose the flexibility, if you will, to make other appropriations under a block buy. And that's why... But you, would, you, I mean, but you wouldn't do a block buy unless you had the money appropriated to do it. Right. And so it's the certainty of that appropriation going forward. Um, but certainly it, it, it makes 
all the good business sense going forward. It is an area that we'll look at with the offshore patrol cutter. So, okay, how about multi-year procurement then? Because you, you, you know you're going to be buying years and years out. Why not, why not do multi-year procurement? If you can save, I, I think it was 5% uh, on the FRCs, right? 5%, $500 million on the OPC program, you could save a billion dollars or 10% 10, 10 and on a, um, on an icebreaker, you could save a billion dollars. So the, the billion dollars you could save on the OPCs, according to, to CRS, um, that's a, a lot of money. Why, why not do that? And wh why, why, why hasn't it been done yet? Yeah. So let me use the OPC as I mentioned. Because the Navy's been doing this. I mean, the Navy buys ships, the Coast Guard buys ships. Much less complex systems, too, than, than, the, uh, than the U.S. Navy buys. You, you don't build complex Navy ships, right? So you would theoretically be easier for the Coast Guard to do this than it is for the Navy, who does this all the time, right? So with the offshore patrol cutter, it'll take the first three. Uh, one is we hold our, our requirements steady. When you change requirements, that's where you see growth in, in any acquisition program, where, where you're building large ships or airplanes or the like. So you hold the requirements steady, but the underlying criteria for the offshore patrol cutter, besides meeting our requirements, is affordability. Um, and by the time you get to the first three, uh, by that time we should be able to lock in what an affordable price is for the offshore patrol cutter, which would be the time to negotiate for the remaining 23, uh, 22, forgive me, uh, to do a multi-year buy, a block buy for those remaining 22 with the underlying criteria is we have locked in on an affordable price for the remainder of those ships. But right out of the starting block, taking a new ship off an assembly line, and, and as we run it through its paces, uh, we don't know what we don't know yet with that first ship coming off the line. So you're saying you, you, can't, you can't do a block buy until you get through the first three OPCs? I feel like I owe it to the taxpayer to make an informed decision uh, rather than one that hopes for the best. Uh, so by the time we get through the first three, and as the contractor goes through those learning curves to build those first three ships. Uh, that's what that's what happened with, with the NSC. Right. Right. It, it, it didn't, no one knew what they wanted until ship three came out, or four. Uh, number three met all of our requirements. Um, Sean Stackley, who, do you know who Sean Stackley is, U.S. Navy? Um, so when, when Secretary Stackley talks about acquisition, buying ship stuff, it's like Moses coming down from on high with the word of God. And, and Stackley said that there is there's no, no reason whatsoever why the Coast Guard should not be doing multi-year procurement of block buys, meaning it, it should almost be mandatory. So, so I, 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 I guess my question is, you, you said you, you like it, it sounds good, the Coast Guard wants to save money, so what would stop you from doing that going forward? If, if, if anything. Yeah. Um, for us, it's the, always the uncertainty of what's in our acquisition budget. I would love to have Sean Stackley's acquisition but, budget. But if or we give you the money, budget. if, if yeah. we give you the money and the authority, what would stop you from doing a multi-year? Absolutely return? nothing, Chairman. Uh, as, as I've said before, a, a floor of, of a recurring $1.5 billion ACNI budget, put that next to the Navy budget, you know, if we had that reliability, repeatability, that we could certainly move forward with a block buy. If you look across our five-year capital investment plan, as we mature that out, we get to that threshold level that will allow us to make block buy decisions. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll, we'll keep going later, but I'd like to yield to Mr. Gibbs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Admiral, for your service and uh, all your work on the drug addiction and protecting our our shores. I do just want to emphasize what the chairman was talking about with Iran and North Korea and their state-sponsored terrorism and, and the, the uh, tremendous growth of uh, the terrorist organizations out there, and we know what they're, you know, hell-bent to do, and uh, that should be a top priority and a growing priority, so I just want to emphasize that. But I do want to <clears throat> talk a little bit about, since I'm from Ohio, and uh, concerned about the Great Lakes, my first question, Admiral, is uh, uh, I see that um, that the Coast Guard is conducting a mission analysis of the Great Lakes ice-breaking needs. And uh, as you know, the Great Lakes uh, uh, it's lost, loses millions of dollars when, when we have severe winters like we did, not this, this current winter, but the last two winters especially. I want to make sure that you ensure that the analysis that the Coast Guard's doing will, 
will hit those uh, domestic um, ice-breaking targets, which I believe are 95 percent of keeping it open during ice-breaking season. Uh, but hopefully it's based on the worst winters and not this past winter. Can, can you want to address that? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, we are <coughs> restoring our 140-foot uh, icebreaker, icebreaking fleet, uh, and certainly this year has given us a bit of a reprieve. Yeah. Um, there is an authorization for us to uh, to look at another Great Lake icebreaker. Uh, we also have uh, a series of memorandums of agreement with Canada. Um, so, if if we require their assistance to do icebreaking to support our port infrastructure in the U.S., they will provide that to us, and we will do so vice versa as well. Um, the real challenge with moving forward with the Great Lakes icebreaker is what's in my ACNI budget. Um, and, and, it, and it concerns me that for the next four to five years, we will make no investment whatsoever in our military housing. Uh, we underfund some of our shore infrastructure that currently has uh, over a $1 billion shortfall. So uh, we, we, we're paying interest on an existing debt, but we're not making any principal payment into that shore infrastructure. So it really comes down to an appropriation. Um, but can I assume that the winter of 2016 will re be repeated in years following? Uh, that would be a, a flawed decision for a service that prides itself on being Semper Protest to make. Positive news, those 140s uh, are, are being refurbished. And again, we rely heavily on our relationship with Canada as well to address these very concerns that you address with commerce on the Great Lakes. Yeah, I think the one that concerns is the, 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 the situation with the Mackinac. That's the main icebreak in the Great Lakes, right? It is. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Cordero, uh, speaking of Canada, uh, with the water uh, ballast rules in 2014, the Canadian government was proposing the implementation of a transit standard for ballast water regulation. And that, I guess that would mean Canada would apply most of the owners uh, ballast water requirements and vessels that are not actually uh, discharging in Canadian waters, but merely transiting through. The concerns of the pro proposal include the effect of the standard would have on the, our U.S. carriers and shippers. Uh, did the Commission hear from the industry uh, regarding the Canadian transit standard? And I got three here. Did the Commission investigate what Canada was proposing and comment on it and, and engage with the Canadian officials? And then, and then finally, what's the uh, status of the proposal, the Canadian proposal? Thank you for your question, Congressman. Uh, number one, yes, the Commission did hear uh, concerns of some stakeholders in the Great Lakes area. And with that, uh, we partnered with the State Department in regard to certain meetings. Commissioner Doyle uh, led, uh, represented the FMC in meetings that he held in Canada with some of the officials to discuss this issue. In terms of the status, my understanding is there's been no further movement by Canada with regard to the implementation of those standards. So at this point, uh, my understanding is there's no further movement on that in terms of any application of that. But of course, our office will follow up with you to uh, absolutely confirm that and uh, okay. uh, give you more detail on that. But thank you for your question. Well, well that's good news, because uh, we certainly don't want the Canadians making it tough on our side. We've got to work together. Absolutely. You're saying. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Garamundi is recognized again. He likes us. It gets to go back to him every time. <laughs> Yeah. We're a little short on our side over here. Um, Admiral Zumkov, if you were told to do a block buy, the onus is really on us, that year after year we would have to meet that commitment, whatever it was. Could you um, do a little mathematical calculation for us, the amount that could be saved by a block buy versus the penalty of us? failing to adequately fund at some future year the requirements. I suspect that that uh, equation would work out that it's still cheaper to do a block buy, even though there may be a penalty because of our failure to fund the program. Uh, yeah, Congressman, I'll be happy to provide that information to you. I'll get my stubby pencil to work, but probably not an answer I could give you, you know, here at this committee hearing. Um, but I know you look out for the best interest of the Coast Guard, and we owe that so we can go, both go in and make informed decisions on block buys going forward, especially I think for the OPC. The, I know I, and I believe the chairman, would like to see a block buy requirement in this year's appropriation. And we need to have some sense of the savings that would be achieved by a block buy, let's say, over the next five years. Okay, if you would do that, it would be helpful to us as we move that forward. 
Um, Coast Guard housing, you're short 1.1 billion. Is there some way we can find at least $100 to buy a couple of gallons of paint? Uh, this should see, it would seem to us in this budget that as we move this appropriation forward, that we find at least some money for uh, the, the repair and of the housing. To go just to zero it out is just frankly not acceptable. Um, I got to move to some other questions. Uh, do you mind if I go to Janica? Or do you want? Okay. Mr. Janica, how long are we going to have to fight this food aid program before, I guess, till we get a new administration? Is that a fair? What's in the 17 uh, budget request, Congressman, uh, is the administration proposal? Well, we will eventually have a new administration, which I hope has more uh, sense about how to deal with this. <clears throat> If we move, if the administration's proposal were to move forward, what would be the effect on the American maritime industry? Well, I can tell you, uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, we have seen a, uh, since 2011, a 40% drop in the total amount of uh, food aid cargo and agricultural cargo that's been carried on ocean shipping. Um, and as a result of that, we've seen a decrease since 2012 uh, in combination with the DOD cargos, which have also dropped about 75% in the same period. Uh, we've seen a reduction from 106 ships at the end of 2011, the 1st of uh, January of 2012, uh, to the current number of 77 today. Uh, it's a 26 percent drop in the fleet. So we know that there is, has been an effect, but it's a combination of not just the, 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 the amount of food aid cargoes, it's a combination of all the cargoes uh, that are being carried. Uh, predominantly, that used to be uh, DOD cargo, uh, roughly 80 percent, but now with the, uh, the smaller footprint that we have overseas in basing, but also the number of troops that are stationed overseas, we're seeing much less uh, DOD cargo movement, and as a result, uh, the agricultural want, actually I becomes a focus. larger con contribution to the total Pre carriage. I appreciate the DOD. Focus specifically on the food aid. How many ships have been lost as a result of the change in the food aid, and more importantly, how many ships would be lost if we were to accept the administration's proposal on the food aid? We estimate six to 12 have been lost uh, as a result of some of the changes that have occurred since 2012. Uh, I can't give you an exact number, but we do know that uh, the, the fleet that's had the most challenge is our Balker fleet, especially dry bulk, and many of those ships are being laid up right now. Uh, so I think those ships would be at risk, though it's, it's at least four to six. Four to six more ships. Sir. And the number of mariners that would be losing their jobs as a result of that? Each ship carries a, a combination. It's about 20 to 25 billets, so you're looking at 40 to 50 per vessel total. And the risk to the United States national security of not having another uh, six ships available? If we lose additional ships, I, I'm putting it from a mariner availability standpoint today, uh, I put us in the amber range, and I have a, probably a, uh, a delta of about four ships uh, before I go to the red. Uh, so I'm concerned about the number of mariners that are available to fully man the government reserve sea lift feet uh, in a time of either a conflict or in a humanitarian crisis if we fully had to activate that. So if the food aid program were to go forward, we would lose four to six more ships, and that puts the nation's security with regard to the availability of ships into the red zone, as in the very dangerous? As part of the administration's uh, proposal, uh, there is a $25 million that is uh, intended to compensate for the, that loss. Uh, and so uh, their $24 million would be used for non-MSP ships uh, specifically, uh, and then $1 million uh, for the, the mariners themselves. So that should offset the, the loss that is the administration's so in, proposal. So, but the mariners are not working, and therefore they may not be licensed. That is part of the challenge, yes, Congressman. So instead of spending $25 million in basically what is a subsidy, a welfare check, we could just maintain the food program as it is today and ship food, keeping the ships busy, keeping the mariners busy, and actually doing something rather than a welfare check? The idea of the subsidy uh, or the $24 million would actually keep those ships in operation, so we do not see that the mariners would be lost, but it, it, your, your analysis is not flawed. My analysis is not what? Flawed. 
In other words, correct. Correct. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Graves is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral, uh, welcome. I appreciate you being back again today. Uh, in, in the budget proposal, you uh, included an increase of 325 uh, million, uh, excuse me, 325 personnel. You also have a decrease of 400 personnel, including the elimination of uh, high value escorts and other support services. Can you talk about um, how this uh, sort of adapting or how this change of the Coast Guard is occurring and sort of the motivation behind the increase and the decrease? Uh, Congressman, we have a, actually, it, it is a net gain at the end of the day of, uh, of 325 personnel, but uh, when you ask, well, how did we arrive where we are today? Uh, and, and it goes back into some of these other questions about acquisition, repeatability, you know, what that floor needs to be. Uh, and in order to keep the National Security Cutter program alive, uh, without the support of this administration, uh, we had to make force structure reductions in order to keep that program viable. Uh, and so now that we have the best acquisition in Coast Guard history, uh, we need to make sure that we're investing in the talent uh, that's going to operate and maintain these platforms into the future as well. Uh, so when we talk about, and as uh, mandated in the authorization bill, uh, we owe you a force planning construct uh, of what does the Coast Guard need to meet mission in the 21st century when it comes to people. Uh, we've made that argument when it comes to platforms, but without people, you know, those platforms really uh, will not get the job done. Sure. Okay. So, I mean, in, in summary, adapting to the evolving mission of the Coast Guard, evolving threat and, and new equipment. Yes, sir. Uh, all right. Thanks. Um, uh, another question for you. Uh, two years ago, you said, um, I think at the end of the day, uh, uh, change of the Jones Act would put our entire fleet in jeopardy. Um, can you talk briefly about the current status of the uh, defense industrial base and, and, and as we're working on this recapitalization effort for the Coast Guard? Uh, I can provide you a couple of data points. Uh, one, uh, when I look at our, our acquisition program itself, holding steady requirements, on-time delivery, uh, and platforms that will be serving our nation 40 years from now. When I meet my counterparts from, from other Coast Guards, including the Commandant of Japan Coast Guard, uh, he is under scrutiny because at the end of 20 years, many of their ships reach the end of their service life. They say, well, why can't you be like the United States Coast Guard? And I think that's a testimony to the quality of product that we're building here. Another data point when I was at NASCO Shipyard, where they were building uh, one of two uh, ships for tote. This is an LNG and conventionally fueled uh, U.S. flagged container carrier that will run between Jacksonville and Puerto Rico. State of the art. Absolutely state of the art. Uh, you take Jones Act away, the first thing that goes away are these shipyards. And what goes behind that is the Mariners. And as we talk about what's the world going to look like 10 years from now, and if we have a pure competitor, but if we don't have a U.S. fleet, and if we don't have a U.S. shipyard to constitute that fleet, as we look at how did the United States prevail in Moore's past, it really began with our industrial base. Uh, in the Jones Act, I am concerned you know, any repeal of that would cut at the heart of that industrial base. And, and, and how would the repeal or changes to it affect from a security, from a safety, from a pollution perspective, having foreign vessels uh, running inland waterways of the United States? Uh, we do what's called port state control boardings. Uh, these are foreign flagships that, that do trade with the United States, and we inspect them for their port security code compliance under IMO and for their safety of life at sea compliance, also under the International Maritime uh, Organization. On any given day, we detain two or three ships um, that arrive in the United States because they are not in compliance, even though that flag state upholds that they are. Uh, we're dealing with an oil spill in Long Beach today, a foreign flag carrier. Uh, we don't know why, but it had an oil spill. Um, so yes, the United States does hold a higher standard uh, when it comes to safety and security. No one does it better than the United States. Thank you. Uh, Chief, thanks for being here, and good to see you again as well. Um, at the State of the Coast Guard um, uh, address that the, that the Commandant gave, he, he really focused upon the people of the Coast Guard. That was a, a, a big part of his, his um, theme of his, of his message. Um, if, if you deviate or you have different thoughts uh, than the Commandant, then I assure you your secret's safe with me. Um, but I wanted to ask you, uh, what are your greatest concerns for the, for the Coast Guard workforce? 
Well, thanks, Congressman. I I'll tell you, our folks are the very best at what they do. Despite budget or resource deficits, they'll find a way to get the job done. And it's often at a cost of a work-life balance. So what concerns me is when we uh, steer away from programs that make them more resilient, family, child care programs, housing, uh, tuition assistance, all those tangible programs that keep them focused on getting the job done. Uh, it also is a, it's a retention tool for us because they need to know that we got them covered. Uh, but again, I, I think we've got the very finest workforce we've ever had in my 33 years of service. And I just like to protect those programs that support them so that, one, we've got a, a new retirement system that comes online in 2018 that we don't know yet how that's going to affect our workforce. Uh, but we need to uh, focus on those things because there could be opportunity for people to leave service before uh, they serve a 20-year career after that plan goes into effect. And I believe that these uh, programs that directly support them and their families are things that our budget process has to pay attention to. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. We're, we're now uh, honored to have the ranking member of the full committee here who understands that it's not all about just trains and trucks and planes, but the importance of the maritime industry and the Coast Guard. Mr. DeFazio is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm honored to be uh, here uh, before the subcommittee today. Um, uh, Admiral, good to see you. Um, Mass Chief, good to see you. Um, you might remember last year uh, I made a bit of a point uh, regarding the unfunded uh, uh, projects and or backlog, and I see we have a somewhat more comprehensive list, that, although it, it's, uh, it, it's focused on very important things, so I'll go over that first, and then I'll talk a little bit about total deficiencies. Uh, I am concerned that uh, we're looking at less, you know, fewer dollars this year uh, to deal with the, uh, you know, shore side infrastructure backlog than last year. And it seems to me that, and, and I'm not an expert uh, on housing, although I have my own home repair projects all the time, but it seems to me that some of these things you're dealing with, whether it's docks, hangars, uh, housing, stations, uh, you know, that there's probably a point at which they are deteriorating more quickly. Uh, they are uh, impeding some, to some extent of uh, the mission because the facilities aren't adequate. Uh, and, uh, you know, this causes me concern. Now, I know that you're in a chain of command, uh, you know, under uh, the, the president, and you submit some requests uh, to them, and the trolls at OMB, uh, you know, cut a lot of things out, and then we end up with whatever your proposal is, which is less than you originally proposed, which is what we see, and then we get this. Um, but at least this is more comprehensive. I mean, can you just address this a little bit? I mean, it, it seems to me that this, you know, even if we move ahead with all due dispatch with, uh, with the new class of cutters and do all the other things we're doing, uh, this is going to impede the mission to some extent. Is it not, sir? Uh, it will. And I first, uh, Ranking Member, uh, I'll reflect on, on this year's omnibus appropriation in 16. Uh, as I said at, at the very beginning, uh, it did get us out of debtor's prison so, somewhat. Um, it brought down some of the principle of our shore ACNI debt that we carry going forward. Um, but you can see, you know, right now, we will find on that unfunded priority list uh, to be able to address some of our military housing, but not all of it. Uh, some of those costs are actually hidden in our major acquisition shore infrastructure, which is as we move new ships into new home ports and piers and the like, there's infrastructure that comes in with that for for people as well. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, what missions matter the most uh, across our 11 statutory missions? First of all, mariners in distress on the high seas. And, and you and I have talked about this at length. Uh, and we've had several heroic rescues in, in your district here of late. I am very mindful of that. And as the chairman and others have brought up, the security of the homeland, which begins at sea, and so those will continue to be our areas of focus, and we cannot dismiss what's happening in the high latitudes in the Arctic and Antarctica as well. Uh, so as we look at building heavy icebreakers, uh, we look at some top line relief to bring that program of record as we're building national security cutters, fast response cutters, an offshore patrol craft, 
Uh, we're modernizing the C27J, uh, and now we're bringing in an icebreaker. So we have a lot going on right now in our acquisition budget, but we can't take our eye off this other ball. And it talks to some of these quality of life investments that Master Chief mentions as well. Uh, the health of the workforce for the 21st century, of course, all the armed services, is, is a concern for me, as it is for all of the service chiefs in uniform today. Oh, thank you, Master Chief. Uh, since you're the representative of the troops, uh, you want to give us a little more perspective on that? Just fill out a little bit what it means uh, in terms of problems with housing and or facilities. Well, thanks to this year's budget, we were able to make some pretty modest uh, investments in some of our housing, new housing in Astoria, Oregon, Kodiak, Alaska. We've been able to uh, bump up some of the, the renovations that are done on some of the older housing. Uh, but most of our units, uh, as you well know, are, are outside of a base-centric DOD or Coast Guard base area. They're in very rural, very coastal communities, sometimes very high cost. And it's not just the, the Coast Guard-owned housing that concerns me. Uh, when we talk about basic allowance for housing that's proposed to be reduced over the next five years, that can really hit home for some of our folks that are in those high-cost areas that don't really have a choice when, uh, you know, they're competing with tourists and, and other high-cost uh, competitors there to, to find adequate housing and often have to drive an awful long way to, to get to work and or with medical care as well. And since some of these very remote areas that uh, don't have access to a military treatment facility, and they could be two hours away from the nearest doctor that accepts TRICARE. And that, that burden is on the member to, to get them and their families there. So those things concern me, and we need to continue to stay focused on that because I, I don't want people making career decisions based on those type of services that are, that are either hard to get or they're just too expensive, and then they decide that they don't want to be in the Coast Guard anymore. But the, the folks are not complaining. They're out there doing the very best that they can, and you know they're, they're not shy about it, as you know, visiting some of our units. They're not shy about showing off uh, their talent and what they're really, really good at. Yeah, uh, we had a good example of that on the, on the bar. That was great. Uh, the yeah. Astoria bar, not the bar bar. Yes, sir. Uh, that was fun. <laughs> um, Admiral, I was pleased that you mentioned uh, the icebreakers. I assume uh, we're now in the evaluation phase on the uh, uh, mothballed. I always mix them up, the star and the sea. Which one? The sea. The sea. Uh, in terms of you know, the feasibility of uh, you know rehabilitation versus uh, new, are we moving along with that analysis? Uh, uh, yes, we are ranking member, and it was uh, ranking member Garamendi who gave me the homework assignment uh, that I will provide you know the materiel assessment, which is being done by a third party, by the way, of what would it take to reactivate the Polar Sea. All right, um, and that will really be a business decision going forward, recognizing how many years do we buy forward with that reactivation, but does it get us out of the proposition of at what point do we build new as well? Um, but we will provide that by July 31st, and I believe Great. Congressman Gary Mendy backed me up a week, so that would make it July 24th. Oh, yes, before we depart for the longest uh, summer break ever, since, and I've been here a long time. No, sorry, district work period, sorry. Oh, excuse me. Um, no, that, that's, uh, that's excellent, and uh, I'll look forward uh, to that analysis. You, you, other, one other thing quickly, you mentioned the uh, uh, having to, have, you know, sometimes build new port infrastructure to accommodate uh, new cutters, uh, you know, and, and I know you're evaluating uh, where we're going to base uh, cutters, but I would say you're, you're ready-made to go in Coos Bay, North Bend uh, for, uh, for those uh, two, two of those ships, so. Uh, just to put in my plug locally. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the ranking member. Re re really quickly, before I go to Mr. Rouser, we, we talked about the block buy and the multi-year procurement stuff. So, so you have CRS, you have Stackley. I would like you, if you could, to do your own study uh, and not take a long time, but see how much the Coast Guard thinks it will save if you wait till ship three or you, for the phase two of the OPCs, <clears throat> excuse me, phase phase two of the FRC or the entire OPC program, if you wait till, till ship three and you do multi-year buys, how much money you think you will save? Okay. Okay. Absolutely, Chairman. And it was my understanding is, you know, I wouldn't wait till year number three because I'll be long retired. Sure. Uh, no, we, we need to provide, you know, this Congress 
you know, that, that diligence. And so we'll work with your staff to run those numbers okay. uh, in terms of what are the savings, if there's a penalty involved as well, uh, so we can look at this holistically. Okay, thank you. With that, the uh, gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Admiral, first let me say uh, how much I appreciate uh, the work of the Coast Guard, uh, everything that you do in such a professional uh, uh, manner, and, and uh, what a great uh, service and, and uh, commitment you have to, uh, to this country. I have a, uh, a, several questions here, and I'm just trying to get some clarification, and this is an issue that's come to my attention over the past uh, couple days, and it deals with uh, implementation of the safety of life at sea International Maritime Organization guidelines regarding the verified gross mass of a container carrying cargo, uh, something that I understand you're uh, uh, more familiar with than I am. Obviously, exports of cargo from the United States are crucial uh, to economic prosperity in this country, steel and agriculture in particular. Uh, my district in southeastern North Carolina is uh, predominantly agriculture. Uh, we have the port right there at Wilmington. Uh, so I have an uh, invested interest uh, in this matter for a variety of reasons, but that one specifically. Is it correct that the Coast Guard does not intend to enforce the SOLAS gu uh, guidelines? Walk me through this and, and what's transpired here. So the Coast Guard does enforce SOLAS guidelines. Um, as I mentioned uh, to Congressman Graves, uh, we uh, inspect ships for SOLAS compliance and also for security compliance and we'll detain those ships if they're not in compliance. Uh, now, for an exporter, uh, and let's use grain as an example, uh, maybe that grain goes in a rail car. Um, and so that exporter uh, has no direct involvement with the container, but when that grain goes into a container, uh, it then goes to the carrier, uh, and it, it arrives in a manifest. It'll say what the contents of the container is and what is the weight of the container. Uh, and if that carrier does not see a weight for that particular box, he won't take it on board the ship because he would be in violation of these SOLAS guidelines. But more importantly, these guidelines are designed for stability purposes and for safety of life at sea. So what happens is that box does not get loaded until the weight can be verified. And there are two methods of verifying that weight. Uh, you can add the container and the contents all at once or you can take the, the weight, the tear weight that shows up on that box, and then add in whatever weight is added into it, add the two, and then that's the weight that would show up on the cargo manifest. But the carrier has to see a weight before they will take that container on board, effective one July of this summer. I'm sorry I wasn't here to hear the uh, entire uh, question and answer uh, with uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Graves. I was chairing another subcommittee hearing uh, on Subcommittee of Livestock and Foreign Ag on the House Ag Committee a few minutes ago and, and just got here. But my question and, and what I'm uh, most concerned about, uh, apparently the shipping industry feels like this is a, a change in direction. Uh, the rug's been pulled out from under them, so to speak, in terms of uh, what they were anticipating and, and the conflicting statements from the Coast Guard. Can you address that specifically? Uh, I will. The, uh, the IMO guidelines came out on the 9th of June of 2014, um, and we've been w engaged with the World Shipping Council, a number of exporters, carriers here in the United States. Uh, so we've had a very aggressive outreach campaign as this date draws nearer. Uh, and, and perhaps it's our outreach campaign that have sensitized others, and maybe it wasn't the IMO guidelines that, that came out, and I can only conjecture in that regard. Uh, but the information has rolled out and has been rolling out for nearly two years now as this implementation date draws near. Uh, foreign carriers are pretty much all in compliance today. Uh, when I was at the container terminal in Long Beach uh, a month and a half ago, um, all of the containers that come onto that yard are already weighed before they go in. So I am not seeing a sky falling panacea playing out around us, um, but we need to make sure that there aren't unintended consequences why we're continuing to reach out with, with the many exporters and, and how their commodity ultimately gets in the container and that container shows up on a manifest before it's loaded on board a ship. Uh, what's needed is that final weight. Uh, but by and large, most of these manifests already have that weight filled in in that column. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank the gentleman. I, I've got a, just a quick bring up a subject, and it's uh, 
un unmanned aerial systems. S and from what I understand, the, the CBP has kind of taken control for the Coast Guard. If the Coast Guard wants to use UAS, they have to use CBP UAS. Is that correct? I Meaning you don't have organic assets. Correct. So if you, so if you want to use them, you have to say, hey, Border Patrol or hey, whoever, we, we would like you to launch a UAS over this part of the uh, Caribbean, right? Correct. Oh, has that ever happened? Uh, it has. We've done two proof of concepts, one in the Caribbean, uh, and then we did another one in the Eastern Pacific. Um, what this particular UAS lacks is a wide aerial surveillance sensor. Uh, it, it ostensibly looks through a straw. Um, and so it, it really... Uh, let me stop you there, though, because I mean, we, we have wide, wide area surveillance stuff, and you, have, and you have the straw stuff. You have whatever you want. I mean, you could slap a sensor, any kind of a sensor, on, on any UAS, pretty much. So why, why haven't you then? Well, I, I can't speak for another agency's acquisition project. Which, to my point, why doesn't the Coast Guard have their own organic assets if, in which you could put on what you, whatever kind of sensor you wanted? So two-part answer to your very challenging question. Uh, the first is our immediate need is, is sea-based uh, UAS uh, because we, we follow a very uh, mobile threat. Uh, and so... Uh, within our, you know, this year we will down select, and it's not a major acquisition, a small UAS that will go on board our national security cutters that can look over the horizon, provide covert situational awareness, where we're first pulling in national level intel, so we already know that something's out there. Uh, and then we use a small UAS to discern what it is. Sure. Uh, and we've had great success using this in the past. But this is going to this technology will emerge, and do we need to be in the land-based UAS program? Absolutely. Uh, and as you look across our capital investment plan, as we get into years 20 and 21, uh, we start making significant down payments on, on UAS, which would be land-based, to keep step with technology as that emerges as well. But this will be a, a key contributor for maritime domain. Here's, here's what I would ask. I mean, if, if you're using a land, land-based UAS, you're, you're not, they're not going to be armed, obviously. You're, you're going to have over 40 hours of time of, up in the air if you use a Predator, for instance. Right? You're going to be up, up in the air for, for, for 40 hours plus. You, you don't need to launch off a ship because you have, you have so much staying time where, where they can loiter pretty much, you know, forever. You have two or three, you're up in the air 24-7. 20, I hope the money's not going into proof of concepts or seeing, hey, let's, let's, let's try to, to figure out what we need when, when they make what you need right now, especially for the, the land-based side. I mean, that's out there. It exists. There don't, there don't need to be any tests done on it or anything else. And I would, I'd, and I would say for your, um, for your ship-based UAS, let the Navy lead the way, right? Why, why not use what the Navy's doing? If the Navy's spending tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars on R&D, on, on ship-based UAS, whether it's a fire scout, whether it's a you know, rotary-type uh, UAS or a fixed wing, they're, they're doing all of this for you. Right? Why, why not piggyback? Uh, so we, we've done exactly that. So we took station astern of the Navy as they went ahead with a ship-based UAS. Uh, we put it on one of our ships, um, and it's the same size as one of our manned helicopters. It comes with a support team of 20 people. Um, and so, in, in our case, that's a lot of people. It becomes the tail that wags the dog. Uh, so that's why we're looking at small UAS uh, going forward. Um, at the same time, though, we made an investment in, in the, the people wear. Uh, we have Coast Guard members working with CBP, so we operate these land-based UAS. Um, and that is a down payment, at least in the skills that it's going to take to bring this fully on board into the Coast Guard as we take advantage of this technology. Gotcha. Um, Administrator Janicki, we've been working the National Maritime Strategy for a couple of years now. How's it going? Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. I, I'm happy to report uh, that the draft strategy uh, is uh, with OMB. It's going through the interdepartmental review. Uh, prior to delivering it to OMB, I did uh, share it uh, with the Committee on Marine Transportation System, about 27 different uh, government agencies and commissions. 
Uh, I've incorporated all of their comments as the comments from our National Advisory Committee, the Marine Transportation System National Advisory Council. Uh, those have all been incorporated in the draft strategy that is currently undergoing interdepartmental review. So I'm hopeful I'll be able to get something that I can publish in the Federal Register uh, here soon, and prior to that publication, uh, we'll provide it to the committees both in the House and the Senate. But, but why, when are we going to get recommendations from you? When are we going to get recommendations? Not necessarily. I mean, we're not doing this as an exercise on how to do it, right? We're doing this so we can actually do something and have an effective maritime strategy that incorporates everybody here today and everybody that operates on the ocean who's not here today, all the fishermen, all the shippers, the Jones Act, all of that combined into one thing, right? Absolutely. So, I mean, so we, we want recommendations from you on what we should do. That's why we're doing this. Absolutely, and that's going to be included in the National Maritime Strategy, Chairman. So uh, when is OMB going to release it? Blink, blink once if it's this year. Blink twice if it's next year. <laughs> we have met with OMB, and I can tell you it's going through the interdepartmental review, and I'm hopeful we'll have it out within a couple of months. Okay. Um, last, last thing really quick. How do you choose who gets the small shipyard grants? Is it geographic location? Is it the type of project? Is it the yard itself that would be doing the shipbuilding? You or all of those things, or what are your? It, it, it's really all of the above, Chairman. Uh, and I will tell you, that from a distribution standpoint, uh, and we took a look at the actual numbers, we had 80 uh, applications that were submitted uh, with this particular round when it closed back on the 16th of February. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, um, we had 118 that were submitted, a total of $80 million in requests. Uh, of those, we had about 22 from the West Coast, six were from California. Uh, so it's a pretty even distribution, uh, about uh, 28 or so from the West Coast, or from the Gulf Coast, uh, 22 from the West Coast, and the rest are from the East Coast. So it's a fairly equal distribution geographically. Uh, we do take a look at the return on investment. We do take a look at the projects. In this particular case, uh, thanks the uh, the Congress for appropriating $5 million, but it is a, a much smaller amount uh, in order to disperse, and we're probably going to be limited to about eight different projects. So we're, it's going to be a very small portion of that, which was uh, uh, the applications that were actually submitted. Uh, but we do take a look at the whole project in terms of wh what the return on investment you get in terms of employment opportunity, you know, how it potentially impacts the local com community. Uh, have you received a previous grant? All those things are factored into this, uh, this, the uh, review. Hey, uh, thank you all f for being here, and uh, I'm going to pass it off to Mr. Graves. I'm going to go with the Army Chief of Staff in, in town here, and I'm going to yield to Mr. Garamundi, and then Mr. Graves is going to chair and, uh, and finish up. So thank, thank you all. We're going we'll, to we'll, keep on working and pushing forward, and we look forward to doing Block by stuff, UAS, happy Coast Guard people, maritime strategy, and, uh, and, and great oversight from the FMC. So thank you. Mr. Garamundi is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's just take, you just mentioned the small shipyard grant program. Uh, it zeroed out this year, a little bit zeroed out in 2017. Is that correct? And um, you, you discussed it. Have you engaged, Mr. Janikin, have you engaged with the SBA and other governmental, federal governmental programs uh, to assist the small shipyards, everything from educational programs, job training, SBA and the like? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I have not personally engaged. I, I would have to go back to my staff and, and check and see if we've done that. Uh, we do know that as we build the budget, you know, some of the, we are challenged with our top line number. Uh, in the 17 requests, we had to take a look at some other priorities that we had to, and one of those included the, uh, our ship disposal program, uh, primarily because I'm under a very tight timeline with the California Descent Decree to remove the last remain, remaining ships that were identified of the 57 back in April of 2010, so I had to put a priority. And in some cases, those priorities beat out other priorities. Otherwise, uh, I would like to be able to include this funding in, in every year because we know that it has a great return on investment. Well, here's my point. Uh, there are other federal programs that could be coordinated with the uh, Small Shipyard Grant Program. Uh, everything from job training uh, to the SBA. SBA has actually had a significant increase in their budget year, year after year. So if you look at that and maybe they're doing the same thing, maybe they're not, uh, I'm going to go at them and find out. Um, with regard to um, the uh, Scrap metal ship disposal. You mentioned California. I think you're talking Sassoon Bay. You had three ships there. 
Am I remember? I think, yes, it is. Mare Island's about five miles away. So why are you taking all these ships to Texas? Uh, currently, uh, the Mare Island is not a qualified uh, maritime administration uh, disposal facility. Uh, is it not? It has they not, have not requested. In fact, it's, they it's, did not, it's not been years. requested uh, under the new ownership. Oh, you do not take into account the cost of moving the ship all the way to Texas from California, do you? But we actually do take into account it in terms of the request for appropriations. We also have requirements from an invasive species standpoint to be able to, to dry dock them before we actually remove them from the in terms California of the bid waters. Competition. In terms of the bid competition, you do not. The cost of moving the ship is separate from the from the uh, bid itself. So the bid might be 100 for Texas, and um, I don't know 105 for Mare Island or San Francisco. But the cost of moving the ship is not part of that bid, is it? Uh, the the bid for a uh, sales that actually is included. And, but if we do a service contract, we have to include that as part of. Uh, the contract to be able to get it moved. Uh, one of the challenges is currently today we're at a historic low for the number of ships that we actually have remaining to be recycled. That number is 16 today. Uh, I think it's a business decision on the part of the companies who decide to do recycling. Uh, in this particular case, Maryland does not have an application in with us to certify them as a recycling facility. Okay. Uh, I want to move on. Uh, Mr. Cordero, you say you're overloaded with uh, 75 requests for information. That's could correct. You, could you send us information as to what those 75 are, and are we the problem? We, the Congress, requesting multiple uh, reviews and information? And if so, could you please describe the 75, not here but in writing, so that we might assist you in reducing the onerous burden that's been placed upon you? Thank you for the question, Congressman. We will do that. Good. Maybe we can help you. Um, the supply chain. You spoke of the supply chain. I believe we moved a bill out of here called the FAST Act that had a freight movement. That's correct. In it. How are you coordinating your work with the freight movement? Well, first of, of all, uh, by way of the Department of Transportation, uh, they will have the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, which will form a working group uh, to address some of these issues. Uh, one of the primary questions is in terms of the uh, metrics, the work performance group. The FNC is identified as one of the parties to that uh, group, and we'll be more than happy to participate and offer our insight with regard to that. So you are clearly integrated into and coordinating with the freight movement programs that the Department of Transportation uh, is putting together? Uh, absolutely. We, we will uh, partner with them. Uh, the administrator has been very helpful in working with the FMC, as well as the Department of Commerce, and as well as the uh, Surface Transportation Board. Uh, one of the good things that we've been doing in the last couple of years is partnering with our fellow agencies regarding issues of mutual interest. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chairman Hunter left to go talk to the Army about their needs, which is important. Mm. But also going on simultaneous with this hearing was General McDo on the other side of this building. And I've been informed that General McDo said that he has a very serious concern about the ability of the Merchant Marine to meet the needs of his global movement of men, women, and material. So, Mr. Janikin, can you explain to me why you and the administration are further weakening the ability of the Merchant Marine to have cargo? as in the food aid program, if we have a national security issue that Mr. Du spoke about just a few moments ago, is it that the administration is not coordinating on this critical issue of the ability to move material? Uh, thank you for the... Uh, so you seem to be going in different directions here. Can you explain why you are going in different directions, why we have Mr. McDo over there saying he is terribly concerned about this, and then, on the other hand, your organization and the USAID removing cargo. 
Ranking Member, uh, Congress, the General McDo and I are very closely tied with regards, and the, the real issue he's talking about is the Mariner numbers, and I talked a little bit earlier about the Mariner pool and where we are. And it's, the, the real it, issue is cargo. Well, without so cargo, cargo, you don't have ships. Without the, ships, you don't have mariners. I agree, sir. Cargo comes from export-import bank uh, loans, uh, guarantees. It comes from military, as you said earlier, and it also comes from food aid and other things. You and the administration are rapidly reducing one of the three. Why are you doing that when we have, at least according to Mr. General McDo, a significant national security issue. Why are you doing it? Is it that you're not coordinated? The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing? Or maybe you just don't care about this? And I, by you, I mean the imperial you. The administration's proposal, uh, Ranking Member, is to ensure that there is some funding in the program. That is what's in the $25 million to try well, to offset some of this challenge. Program. We, we certainly uh, we, would, dis, would tend to disagree with that. This would be a welfare program, but we recognize that a program that's modeled after the MSP program works. Uh, so that is the reason why we structured it as we did, as we attempted to support the administration's uh, proposal with regard to food aid reform. That was a piece that was actually installed as part of that proposal, uh, and that is the administration's request uh, for, to achieve the 25 percent additional the, flexibility the for food aid reform. The request was to reduce food and transfer the money to the military, that is for the MSP program, which was a very interesting program. So we got hungry people in Africa. We're going to reduce the money for them and give it to the military. Is that still part of the program that you're proposing? This th year? Th that is not the administration's position. That was, was. a. It was. No, there was a discussion that was ongoing going between the uh, USAID and MARAD to uh, support a proposal uh, as a food aid reform. That is not on the table any longer, Ranking Member. Any longer. Good. No. So where's the $25 million coming from? $25 million is included in the, the MARAD's uh, 2017 budget request as part of the MSP uh, program, and it is an, an, an effort to ensure that any type of food aid reform, in this particular case for the 25 percent additional flexibility for interventions that include local and regional purchase, to ensure that it does not affect the merchant marine fleet. Wouldn't it be better all the way around to ship food than to just ship money? USAID has, uh, has indicated that the, the cost of that uh, actually does have an impact on the number of uh, folks that can be fed. Uh, and again, that's a calculation that they have provided and the administration supports. Well, this fight's not over, and we're going to stay with it. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Administrator, thank you uh, also for being here today. It's, uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, some folks in the office recently had a meeting in regard to the maritime security program. Um, it's my understanding that under that program, you, you have a number of priorities. Number one is, is railroad vessels. Number two um, is uh, um, wait, tankers. A heavy lift. Uh, number two is heavy lift. Number no, three no, number two is tankers. Number three is heavy lift. Uh, that is uh, priorities that were established by the U.S. Transportation So it's Command. Wait, so it's Roro. Tanker. Tanker, geared. Heavy. Oh, heavy lift. Heavy geared, lift, geared container and ship, and then container ship. Okay. Um, and it's my understanding that you have a, a current Section 2 participant that is uh, um, proposing to replace vessels. And as I understand, uh, they're, they're allowed under the operating agreements uh, to uh, provide for a replacement vehicle, a vessel of, of equal or greater capacity. And it's my understanding that they have done just that, but that they're having some trouble um, getting approval from MARAD in regard to that. I, I want to ask, uh, before you make a final decision on that, um, I would like to schedule a briefing with you to get an update on what's going on there, to understand the prioritization process, to understand the compliance or their lack of, of the operating agreement, uh, if you would agree to that before, uh, before you make a final decision on this. Uh, Congressman, I'd be happy uh, to meet with you, but I would uh, emphasize that uh, both of these uh, operating agreements have been vacant uh, since the 15th and the 22nd of September of last year. 
Uh, and so we've been working uh, with the company in question to uh, get substitution, and we have been working and imploring them to fill those vacancies. Uh, and we're reviewing uh, what they have submitted thus far, and I will make a, a decision here shortly. I'm mean, not sure I get with you sometime this week to, uh, to have that discussion. Great, great, thank you. Um, uh, Comment, I'd like to come back to you. Um, there, there's been talk, and uh, following up on our previous conversation, there's been talk about the Jones Act uh, recently, and, and I've, I've seen some folks that have expressed concern about the, about the Jones Act from a fiscal perspective, which certainly uh, concerns uh, me as well. Anything that, that would be um, perceived or in reality, of course, as being a, a waste of taxpayer funds. If, if you, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, if we repealed the Jones Act, we made significant changes. Um, the potential game changer from a security situation and, and many others referring back to your previous comments. Um, do you view, you know, if you were to monetize the Jones Act, the, 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 the um, capability it provides to the defense industrial base, uh, the security uh, stability that it provides, do you view that as a, as a money loser for taxpayers? I can only conjecture on that. You know, my biggest focus is, is, what, is what does it do to our resiliency as a maritime nation? Um, and quite honestly, it will nearly bankrupt our maritime resiliency. When we look at the challenges that the Marriott administrator is facing, that the commander of Transcom is facing in the event of a contingency, and we don't have the lift within the U.S. fleet to respond to a contingency at a point in time we're seeing a reemergence of peer competitors. You know, it's in our nation's best interest, um, and I think from a sovereign interest, not necessarily from a taxpayer, that, that we protect our maritime resiliency, and the Jones Act does provide that wherewithal. Thank you. Uh, another question. Hey, Congressman, um, if I might interject uh, yeah, on, on, on this particular topic. Um, if the build requirement uh, were changed, uh, there's about 40 different yards across the country uh, that are building both federal programs and also commercial. Uh, today, under construction, there are 32 uh, large vessels under construction, and uh, of those, uh, 12 are uh, what I would refer to as normal self-propelled tankers. There's also 20 articulated tug and barges uh, with large vessels in terms of the capability to carry 150 to 200,000 uh, barrels. We also have four uh, what I call special purpose ships. They're their Conros, their, their ability to bury containers and roll on, roll off, and also just regular uh, LNG ready type container ships. Uh, without the Jones Act, that, those builds don't occur, uh, which means that the federal government now has to assume all of the costs of the overhead for that industrial base, which means that your cost for those vessels is going to go up. Uh, the industry itself, and that includes both the federal shipbuilding and the commercial shipbuilding, uh, we just released a study uh, last fall uh, that updated some numbers we did from 2013. That's 110,000 people around the country that are building ships. That's a $36 billion industry. Without that commercial shipbuilding and that industrial base, it, it will have an impact on the taxpayer in terms of what we have to pay to acquire the ships, whether they're for the Navy, the Coast Guard, for NOAA, uh, for the Army Corps. Uh, Administrator, could you provide a copy of that report for the record? Yes, sir, I can. Thank you. Um, so again, I, I want to make note, you know, any program that's going to waste taxpayer funds would obviously cause great concern. Um, and, and I think if you, if you look at only the, the surface, in some cases it may cause concern. But it sounds like, based on what you're saying and some of the Admiral's uh, comments, that when you actually dig deeper, that this does provide value to taxpayers in regard to the resiliency of our, uh, uh, of our defense industrial base and the security of the country. Uh, one last question, uh, Admiral, I want to come back. The, the uh, FY 2016 NDAA bill, the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, transitioned the um, uh, military retirement program for the Coast Guard for, for new um, military service members or, or Coasties from a defined benefit plan over to the thrift savings plan that many other agencies participate in, and it requires participation in that. It provides a match from the Coast Guard in that program. Um, has the Coast Guard talked with OMB uh, to determine how the Coast Guard's current mandatory funding for these benefits can be moved to a discretionary situation as DOD currently is? Uh, Congressman, we haven't, but it's a, it's a conversation we must absolutely have. Uh, right now, we don't know how many people will opt in to up to 5 percent with a matching 5 percent. Um, but we do know if, if we have a significant number, right now that comes out of our operating base. And that will directly impact frontline operations. Uh, it will challenge some of our many other operating expenses that we have right now. And so we need to build that wedge 
uh, for those who will be required to opt in in 2018, whether they contribute to 5% or not. But how many other members with fewer than 12 years of service decide, hey, they want to opt in as well? Um, and so there are real costs involved with this. And right now, our base does not provide us the wherewithal to sustain those type of matching payments for thrift savings. Yeah, thank you. Uh, would you support using the $25 million for increased uh, MSP payments pursuant to the recently passed uh, increase in the authorization? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, to the um, Administrator Janneke. Would that be assuming that uh, food aid reform is uh, actually implemented or not, Congressman? No. What I can tell you with regard to the MSP program is uh, they are under severe pressure with regards. When the program uh, at its inception back in 1996, it was really based on three things. It was based on a stipend amount. It was based on access to government impelled cargo, both DOD and civilian cargo, and also the, the ability to carry civilian cargo. Currently, civilian cargo today uh, is, uh, is there is an overcapacity uh, with the, uh, the, the actual uh, scrapping uh, prices so low. They're not, ships aren't being scrapped, so that capacity is continuing. We've seen the lowest uh, shipping rates uh, in a long time. Our government impelled rates, as I indicated earlier, uh, DOD is down 75%. Uh, agriculture and USAID cargoes are down 40%. The only place you can go uh, if that now is to go to the stipend amount in order to ensure the fleet is viable. Uh, DOD uh, and, and the U.S. Transportation uh, Secretary both support the viability of this program. We understand its significance uh, in support of DOD requirements, specifically for sea lift to globally project and sustain our armed forces. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to enter into the record of this hearing Mr. McDew's testimony uh, today that he provided with regard to the MSP program and the um, necessity for that. I think it would be useful to have it on our record. No objection. Thank you. Um, I think I'd probably leave that go for a while. Uh, Chairman Hunter had been talking about the uh, uh, UAVs or UASs uh, or RPAs, as the military now calls them. Uh, there is a program that the um, CBP is conducting. They have nine Predator B and Guardian, a maritime variety of the Predator B, uh, that they're using to patrol the border. Recently, the um, uh, analysis that's been done on their program uh, by the uh, Department of Homeland Security indicates that that program is just totally inefficient and ineffective. They're spending some 400, actually $600 million annually on that program, presumably to protect like one one hundredth of the Mexican border. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we need to make some choices about here where $600 million is being spent. Uh, we know that the Coast Guard has a need for um, better surveillance, uh, some of which will be provided by new ships, but others of which might be more effectively provided by uh, UASs or UAVs or RPAs, uh, whatever we want to call them. Uh, and so I think this committee ought to take this issue up with the Homeland Security Committees uh, about where $600 million could be most effectively spent in protecting our borders since there's a whole lot more sea border than there is land border, perhaps that $600 million could be better spent by the Coast Guard acquiring maybe those very same assets. So I put that out there. Mr. Zumkoff, are you are Admiral, excuse me. Uh, you normally don't go mess with other people's budgets, but it seems to me you are part of the Homeland Security Department. Have you talked to the Secretary about transferring the $600 million and the nine predators to you to be used more effectively? Uh, that would be the equivalent of internecine warfare, uh, Ranking Member. But what we do have within the Department of Homeland Security, we have a, a joint requirements council. Uh, these nine predators predate the stand-up of this joint requirement council. 
Uh, an example is uh, working with the Navy, uh, we identified the right sensor package to go into our fixed wing aircraft. It's called Minotaur. But it's a defense project. It's been, you know, the R&D, the work has been done. And through, through this Joint Requirements Council at the Department of Homeland Security, it's not just Coast Guard, but CBP is now acquiring this Minotaur project as well. As we mentioned earlier, you know, the remotely piloted aircraft, whatever you want to call them, it's merely a platform. Um, it's the sensor pod that you put in it. And the sensor pod that's in it right now does not afford for the wide aerial surveillance that we would need. But you could argue you might need that same capability, whether you're flying over land or over the water as well. But that would be a process to work through the Joint Requirements Council that has been stood up under this secretary's leadership within the Department of Homeland Security. You got a problem with internal warfare? When you got $600 million that's inefficiently used by the CBP and you're not willing to go grab it and be able to use it more effectively by putting in the new sensor system that, you, that the Navy and you are jointly commissioning? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're at an inflection point where under this secretary's leadership, it's all about unity of effort. Um, and so we've created joint task forces where we've combined the cultures of Coast Guard, CBP, and ICE. Um, and we're, op you know, so we're operating at the front line. Um, but if you have one agency now second guessing how another administration um, expands its it appropriation. It is our business to second guess. And we have a report that there's $600 million that's being spent very inefficiently by CBP with their predator, BUASs. And I'm curious as to whether they could be repurposed. Let me ask you a specific question. Could they be repurposed with a different sensing device for the use by the Coast Guard? Absolutely. Absolutely? Is that Absolutely. Answer? Yeah. Identifying the right sensor pod that and goes Is that this new Minotaur thing that you're talking uh, about? That this would probably be yet a different sensor pod. Does it uh, exist today? Uh, that I can't answer. I think we'll have the, to do I think the chair answered the question as yes, it does. Um, well, it's our business to conduct internal warfare within the departments and to decide where the money goes. We have evidence that uh, the CBP is inefficiently using $600 million and six or nine predators that could be repurposed for the Coast Guard. If you had them, could you use them? Yes. Thank you. No more questions. If there are no further questions. Note that as a yes. <laughs> if there are no further questions, I thank the witnesses for the testimony and, for the, uh, and the members for their participation. The subcommittee stands adjourned.